class at 9.30. I'll come on sometimes a little ahead of schedule to answer any questions any of the students might have who are trying to pass the real estate exam. Some people are actually taking it this morning. Like there is one person who watches every morning, good morning, who um, take this class all the time, but she is taking her test this morning. So I can't wait till she lets me know how she's doing or how she did. So usually if somebody's coming on, I know Romeo's on, but it says there's no people. I just saw my thumbs up. But anyway, if you have questions and you're getting ready to take your California real estate exam, I am here for you and trying to help you get past these books. Now, there's a wonderful person in my neighborhood that has decided to walk his dog around and around and around and around. And my dogs want to eat his dog. So, good morning. How you doing? Um, it says, and kitchen. Wait, gardens and kitchens. Oh, yeah, you guys do the Zen gardens, don't you? Hello, hello. So... Anyway, I wish you were down here because I have this area on the side of my house. Hi, Susan, that totally needs a Zen garden. I just, I have the fountain. I have the area. I dug the hole once. Hi, Maria. And um, you know what? I have those, um, what do they call? They're really strong bamboo trees. And those bamboo trees, they get all over the backyard. They're so messy. So I'm glad you guys are all joining us. It's so weird because it says there's only one person on here and it has all you guys popping up. So it's kind of strange. I don't know why my, why my YouTube is doing that. I feel like I'm absolutely exhausted this week. I'm taking care of my 91 year old mom. So I don't know about you guys, but if you're baby boomers and I'm a baby boomer and we are the people who are gonna take care of our parents until they either go into rest home or whatever journey you get to take with them but I keep being told you know be happy that you have your mom which I am and I keep being told that you know don't waste any time I'll spend it all with her so yesterday we spent the day going out to eat and taking care of her bills so you guys you got to be ready for that and if you're not the kind of person that can be a caregiver you might have to either start learning how to have patience I don't know I was just a natural born caregiver so um, when my dad passed away, I took care of him before he passed. And I don't know. I just think it's the right thing to do. Family should be there for family. And a lot of times it's so weird how sometimes family treats family like, you know, worse. They treat other people on the outside really great. And then they treat the people on the inside really bad when it should be the other way around. Or you should just never treat anybody bad, right? Because if we were all, all nice to each other, life would be good. But anyway, um, it is now 924. So in six minutes, we're going to start trying to get through all this stuff on. It's not just contracts, it's disclosures. And there's a good, mm, well, like three or four more pages. And then there's the chapter summary. And the chapter summary should be pretty good. You're speaking the truth. I know it's you know, um, I do have a sister, everybody, nobody really knows. It's super funny because my brother and I started the company together and then everybody used to ask us how long we worked for our parents and our parents actually worked for us. And then when we'd say something about our sister, people would be like, you guys have a sister? And we're like, yeah, she's a flight. She was a flight attendant for a long time, but she's decided, are you guys ready for this? Um, I probably shouldn't say it. But she's decided that my mom and I are so negative that we are negative feed in her life. So um, she will not speak to us. <laughs> I think that's funny. I'm like Miss Positive and I motivate everybody. But, you know, people are people. And there's always one person in the family that tries to start drama all the time. And, and that's the same way at work. You know, there's always somebody at work that likes to start drama all the time. And it's like, well, instead of doing the negative and instead of starting drama, why not do the opposite and make everybody's life a thousand times better? So I don't get it. But anyway, um, we still have a couple minutes. So if you guys want to ask me anything, you know, we have one of our one of our students. She's taking the test like as we speak right now. She's taking the real estate exam. So I hope she's doing good. Kind of praying that she remembers everything that we've taught her and all that good stuff. So it says, I agree, there's always that one person. I know, positive, only positive around here, right? So um, a lot of people are um, waiting till the time we're starting. Like I said, I don't know what I'm gonna do about my dogs because I might have to, I don't wanna tie them up, I never tie them up. But they sit in the front window and they guard the house. 
And if somebody comes up to the house that they don't know, they bark. But right now we have a new neighbor that decided that it's really cool to walk, it looks like a Doberman pincher, to walk his big dark dog all the way around the cul-de-sac constantly. And every time they come in front of my house, that's what they do, they bark. So it's gonna be distracting. I don't know why he's doing that this morning. So today's the first day. If he decides to do it tomorrow, I might have to ask him. I mean, I know the Kodasak is a public place, but you know, well, instead of walking in circles, why don't you do what I do? Walk down the street, around the corner, and all the way around. Otherwise, we're gonna have dogs that are going crazy all the time. But anyway, it is what it is. I don't know if you guys know this. It's We still have lots of time. Um, <clears throat> I'm losing my voice. That can't be possible. <clears throat> um, I don't. I know. I don't know if you guys have pets, and um, I would love to do a whole segment on what happens in California when you have a dog that's not on a leash, and how important it is to have your dog on a leash. Because I know the importance of that. And one day I wasn't home, and at the time I was still married to my last husband, and um, he opened the front door as he always does when he comes home. And he walked to the back door to let the dogs in and pet the dogs because he was always letting the dogs in and petting them. But it was a windy day and the door behind him wasn't shut all the way. And at those days, which was about eight years ago, my dog, lived, she loved to bolt, bolt. And um, she bolted out the door and he ran after her. And when she ran after her, um, he missed her and he couldn't catch her. He finally caught her. He leaped like Superman and caught the dog and was holding on to the dog. And the lady that the dog was running after had a little tiny dog. And my my bigger dog doesn't like little tiny dogs. So um, she attacked. And um, the lady, well, my, my husband was holding on to the dog. And the lady just stood there with her dog on the ground yelling at him. Why isn't your dog on a leash? Nah, nah, nah. And she didn't realize that the dog got out by mistake. So she just stood there yelling at him. Well, later I found out my husband had Parkinson's. He didn't want to tell me. And um, so he couldn't hold on to the dog. And the lady literally just stood there. Instead of picking up her dog and leaving, my husband kept saying, pick up your dog and go. Pick up your dog and go. The witness kept saying, pick up your dog and go. And, you know, she just stood there and purposely antagonized him. And then the, he couldn't hold on to the dog anymore because he had Parkinson's. And the dog leaped and snapped at her dog's foot. Imagine this craziness. And then her dog nipped her on the neck. So long story short, you guys, homeowners, especially if you have a home and you have dogs, you better be really careful because she sued my insurance company for a million dollars and she got $386,000. So I'm telling you guys, you've got to be really careful, especially if you're a landlord. So we're all here trying to learn about landlord tenant laws and learning about real estate and all the things. Now the dog wants to go outside. So what time is it? I have one minute. Let me run and get the dog outside. You are a pain in the hiney, little girl. Yes, you are a pain in the hiney. Go. So what I was going to say before I had to get up and let the dog out <laughs> um, was... If you're, a, if you're a landlord and you put in the lease, because this is what happened. This is another one my insurance guy told me about. You put in the lease, no pets, and your, your renters sneak pets in. And this is what really happened. A pet snuck out. A dog snuck out and was in the middle of the street, and a neighbor hit the dog. And so the neighbor gets out of the car and goes up to the dog, and the dog's all, Ugh! and um, the dog snaps at her and bites her. She hit the dog with the car, but because the tenant's dog ran out into the street and ended up biting her, she sued the landlord because they're always going to go after the money. They go after, you know, landlords are supposed to be really rich. We have so much money, it's coming out our ears. It's not true. Instead of having a 401k or instead of having something that we didn't know, because I like to see my investment. I don't want to have a 401k that's good morning, Candy. I don't, you know, you guys as real estate agents, you, it, it, you can't, it's hard to have a retirement account because you don't have an employer putting in money in for you. So what I do is I buy real estate. And if you have real estate, you could um, rent it out and it grows in appreciation. And when you get older, we can collect rent instead of worrying about where we're going to get our money from. So imagine a landlord that thinks he doesn't have a dog being sued 
he thinks he, his tenants don't have a dog being sued. He literally proved in the court that it was in the contract that they couldn't have a dog. He still got sued for over a few million dollars because the dog bit the lady who hit her hit the dog by the car. So imagine the stories out there that we may think are not very fair and justice isn't done correctly. So anyway, it is time to start. <coughs> Excuse me. If you did get this book, because a lot of people did get this book, um, we are on page 145. So on page 144 was just what a counter offer looks like. And on 145, we were talking about inspections and advisory for buyers because you should always advise your buyers to get a home inspection because you never know what's going to show up. Now, I want to make it very clear. The home inspection is not for your buyer to get the seller to fix everything about the house. That's not what the home inspection is for. You see the home inspect, so you see things around the house. When you walk through a home and there may be a hole in the wall or something that you, you know, want to ask them to fix. Let me tell you something. If they're living in the house, when they move out, you're going to find a whole lot more things wrong with the house. However, the home inspection is to make sure that the buyer is aware, the buyer's aware of what's going on behind the scenes, like the plumbing, the electrical, you know, um, anything that has to do with, you know, utilities to make sure that the client knows, you know, if there is a problem, how much is it going to cost me? You know, am I getting this home at a price that makes sense to deal with the things that have to be repaired? Because if the seller did not do maintenance, the seller is not planning to do maintenance for the buyer, okay? So the home inspection is purely to make sure the client knows what they're getting themselves into. You can ask for things, but the seller side does not even have to respond to the request for repairs because the request for repairs is not part of the contract, okay? Make that very clear because I get agents, you know, I don't have houses normally that are really bad. If they're really bad, usually a flipper would buy it and they're and they're intending on fixing it and selling it but on a normal on a normal home you know sellers i had they, they if they're going to fix something they usually fix it before they put it on the market other than that they're not going to fix it i highly suggest sellers to get a home inspection and fix the stuff prior to and same with the termite report like we talked about yesterday fix it prior to putting on the market because then you're going to have a lot less problems because if you know what's wrong with the home, if you don't want to fix it, you can disclose it up front and then the buyer may go, you know, I don't even want to look at that home because it has this problem, you know, so take care, you know, take care of the problems as they, you know, before they come instead of as they come. Does that make sense? So going on, we were talking about the inspection. If an agent fails to disclose known defects of a property to the buyer, the buyer can civil um, can file civil action against the agent within two years. So with the inspections and the um, TDS, TDS, Transfer Disclosure Statement, that's where the seller is letting the buyers know everything wrong with it. And the agent is talking with the sellers and making sure that everything's done correctly and following through because the TDS is TWO, two years of a lawsuit. So if they know they find something that should have been known, then there's a lawsuit. Um, when it comes to the purchase contract, the purchase contract's longer, so they have longer time. I guess that's just how I have you memorize it. So the purchase contract is 16 pages, four years to sue. And that's all from the date of close of escrow, okay? So seller slash agent required disclosures. So that's what we're talking about now, the transfer disclosure statement known as the TDS. So whenever somebody asks you for a form and you don't know what it is, it's usually obviously the first letters of the words. So transfer disclosure statement, TDS, requires the disclosure of all known present mold, drug lab use, military ordinances, mellow roost bonds, taxes, everything that you know about the property you need to disclose. Additional disclosures may be needed to further detail the information. The following is alphabetical list of disclosure forms that might typically be required in a residential um, real estate contract. So these are the, the disclosures. Are you ready? We're starting with A. Here we go. A is the agent inspection disclosure designed for use of the agent on the property that are in California Civil Code 1102 TDS requirements. Agent inspection disclosure. Next page. It shows you a copy 
at the buyer's inspection advisory. That's where we tell the buyers, okay, we need this disclosure because we want to make sure you understand that you should have an inspection. So on the next page is the list of additional disclosures that you should know about. And there's the buyer's affidavit and it says FRIPTA compliance. FRIPTA is the Foreign Investors Real Estate Property Tax Act. Good morning, Susan. Documents whether or not the Federal Foreign Investment in Real Property Tax Act withholding is required. It explains criteria to the buyer and the property must meet. So what FRIPTA is, is let me explain that one. So what FRIPTA is, is, and I, and I, I'm going to be, I have to, I have to be blunt with you guys and totally transparent. Good morning. My dog is walking around my feet. Um, FRIPTA is Foreign Investors Property Tax Act. So basically what happens or what was happening was foreign investors would come in from their country and they would buy a piece of real estate. And then after they buy that piece of real estate, they just let it sit there. They don't want to deal with renters. They don't want to deal with tenants. They don't want to deal with the dog running in the street getting hit. Um, so basically what they would do is buy the property and just let it sit there. And over here in Diamond Bar where I live, there's several homes that you drive by and you're like, whoa, that house looks like it's in foreclosure. The weeds are really high. And then you look it up and it's paid full. It's paid in cash. And it's just sitting there earning value, earning appreciation, going up. And the foreign investor is just waiting for that to go up to a time when they might want to sell it or not. There goes the dogs again. So um, <clears throat> anyway, with that said, um, you know, the houses are just sitting there. But then when the, when the foreign investors sell their property, excuse me, Wilfred. You like that name? Wilfred and Mika. I didn't name Mika. So anyway, um, the foreign investors, what they would do is they would sell their property, take their money and not pay the capital gains and go to the country. So what would happen is the United States wouldn't get the um, ex extra taxes on the capital gain. And then there is a Cal Fripta, but they don't really talk about Cal Fripta. So what happens is when those when when we realized we weren't getting our capital gain money from the foreign investors, they made this law. And what happens is now it says this, it says the buyers have to hold it back on the state exam, but we all know how the state exam has things on it that are not correct. So it says that the buyers have to hold the 15% back so that after they hold the 15% back, then is, if the people pay their taxes, great. If they don't pay their taxes, then it's there so that it could be paid. And if, if it was already paid, then of course, it's the seller's money. It's the seller's money because it's for their capital gain. So Cal Fripta is another one they have, but they really don't teach you about that for foreign investors that buy in California. So it'd be interesting if we had all that education right in the right place and we were updated. But some of the things on the state exam, as we well know, are from 1970, 1980. And when they update the test, they just add new questions. So we started out with like 1500 questions. And instead of taking the old questions out, they kept bringing new questions in. So now you guys are getting tested on a pool of 9,000 questions on things that may or may not be correct. I pass! Yay! Congratulations! I know you're so excited. Um, so where are you going to be working? Let us know. So FRIPTA, Foreign Investors Property Tax Act. Got that? So one of the things I mention when I try to mention is California is about a 60%, maybe 55%. Um, tenants and the rest are um, landlords and it's interesting because the landlord tenant laws here in California are making a lot of landlords move and sell their properties here and go buy somewhere else and I would think about that but that's a lot of work so I really don't want to do it so but landlords are they're leaving so if landlords leave are you ready for this you guys have to pay attention and spread the word if landlords leave and foreign investors come in and buy the properties and don't rent them out we already have a housing shortage. We seriously have a housing shortage in California. So if they're not being rented out, Santa Clarita, I love it there. Congratulations. And Antelope Valley, Antelope Valley, that's like a widespread. So anyway, um, you know, if landlords don't want to rent anymore to tenants and they sell their properties and foreign investors come in and just let those properties sit there and we have a shortage, what's next? We really need to see what we're doing and how we're treating people that, you know, are trying to help people and trying to give people places to rent because we're not in it just for the money. We're also in it to rent properties out so people have places to live and to have our investment grow. Okay. So not all landlords are rich. 
which money coming out their ears. So anyway, <clears throat> let's go on. So we have the buyer's affidavit on Fripta. Then we have confirmation of real estate agency relationship. The agency relationship is number one. I've told you guys that over and over and over. Before you show houses to a client, before you sign a contract with a listing, you have to have the agency relationship. This is used to comply with California Civil Code requirements to confirm agency. So it confirms agency in a transaction. This clause is pre-printed in the CAR purchase contract. So it is in there. So it says, Ernesto, do you know or want those answers? How you know we want those answers? Oh, uh, I guess you guys are all asking him for questions and answers. That's cool. So let us know. Let us know anything you saw that we haven't talked about. That would be great because we're not trying to. Um, <clears throat> so uh, from what I understand, when you take your test, you sign a thing that says that you're not going to tell anybody the information on the test. Well, you know, the Department of Real Estate has people that come and take the test that have taken the test. Uh, I wouldn't say thousands of times. I know somebody who took the test 58 times. They've, he's been reported, but he still gets to take the test and he keeps, keeps taking the test for information for his school. So, <clears throat> you know, I don't really know exactly what they're trying to do because I know they also, when you guys walk out of the test, they look on your arms to see if you have written any of the questions down. So, I don't know. Um, you know, we, we're, not, we're not trying to cheat in any way, shape or form. What we're trying to do is educate and if you know you know, it's it's fair on the it's fair if you're being educated on what is actually happening. Hi, Mark. Um, thank you very much. So um, <clears throat> I didn't think I was going to have the energy this morning because my voice is popping in and out. But um, you know, it would be fair if the test was updated and it was on the things that the real world of real estate is. And it would be fair if they didn't have two correct answers and they wanted you to have the most correct answer. But at the same time, you know, we have to. How can you be educated on stuff that you're being tested on that was done in the 1970s? So, you know, if you guys can help each other, I think that's great. You're helping each other learn and grow and be great real estate agents, and that's what we're trying to do. So if, if Ernesto wants to share some information, I think he's okay to do so. So um, go on to the confirmation of real estate agency. Remember that you have to have the agency form signed. Database disclosure regarding registered sex offenders that one's not mandatory and CAR, I don't think makes that one mandatory. Going on to disclosures and consent for representation of more than one buyer or seller. This is super important. And when you read this one, you have to understand and know how to disclose this one. So it's called disclosure and consent for representation of more than one buyer or seller. So what that is, I don't know what this is. Oh, that's like coming around the corner. So what that is, is let's say that you're lucky enough to have a bunch of buyers you're working with and you have three or four buyers. This actually happened to me. I had three people that were all looking for homes and they were all looking for the same kind of thing. They were looking for three bedrooms, two bathrooms, around 1400 square feet in a particular area. So I had three couples looking for the same kind of thing and they all had the same kind of taste. So, you know, I take them out to show them homes and I'm showing them all homes, I'm showing them some of the same homes. And that's why you have this disclosure. Because what if you have two buyers that wanna put an offer on the same home and you're representing both of them and you have to represent them both to the best of your knowledge. Now, the two different sets of buyers are gonna have different opinions on what they wanna write in their offer. So you have to let them know upfront that you may have more than just them who are looking for the same type of home that may be putting an offer in the same property. Okay, so be aware, more than one, it says more than one buyer or seller. This form is used to disclose that the real estate brokerage, not just you, but the brokerage, the people you work with, because remember, you work under the broker and the broker has all those other agents with them, may be representing a buyer or seller that is competing with the broker's principal. It also discloses the possibility that the same real estate broker company may represent both sides and do dual agency. So that one's really important. Disclosure regarding real estate agency relationship. We talked about that one. That one's a confirmation of real estate agency. And then you have the disclosure that you comply with California Civil Code. Homeowner's Guide to Earthquake Safety. So you have to buy, um, you can buy them in packets, I believe, or you can just order them and they um, are emailed and we have an e-booklet. 
and it's about earthquakes because we have earthquakes in California. It doesn't seem like we've had a big one for a while. I think I was teaching during the last big one, and then a couple of years ago there was a huge one. I was in a, I was in a, a tall building teaching, and we were in the conference room, and the building started doing this. And I'm like, are we having an earthquake? And they're like, yeah. And I'm like, what are we supposed to do? We're on the ninth floor. It was, it was kind of funny because by the time we got done talking, the earthquake was done. But there are earthquakes in California. And as you know, on the state exam, it's called the Alquest Proolio earthquake. Um, so you have to know about that and you have to know about the fault zones, okay? So it says it requires the seller and the, agency to, and the agent to disclose to the buyer that the property may be situated in an earthquake fault line. Then we have the lead-based paint and lead-based paint hazard disclosures. It's an acknowledgement and an addendum that homes that were built before 1978, um, they had lead in the paint. And the cool part is, you know, I'm from a smart family. My dad was a chemical engineer. My dad has a patent on how he got the lead out of the paint. So he was super smart. He was a chemical engineer and he worked for a company that hired him to figure out how to get the lead out of the paint. So he did it. Used to comply with federal requirements for disclosure of any known lead-based paint or lead-based paint hazard on any housing constructed prior to 1978 from sellers to buyers and, or from owner or landlord to the tenant. Manufactured homes. A lot of people are doing manufactured homes. I would think a really smart investor would buy a big piece of land if they have the money, because I almost did this. I almost bought a mobile home park, but I almost bought a mobile home park over by the river where you could go water skiing. You have no idea. I mean, think about this. It's pretty logical. Let's say that you have 200 mobile homes on one lot and you have all them all connected and they're all paying you a thousand dollars a month. I mean, that could be crazy. Mobile homes, you guys. And it's funny because whenever I teach about mobile homes, everybody goes, oh, mobile homes. You know that it, near the beach over in Malibu, and I think Palos Verdes, they have mobile home parks where the mobile homes are selling. Now we know where you got your brain. Oh, yeah, my dad. Um, my dad was really, really smart. And then my brother was really smart. And both of them had photographic memories. So I don't have that. So I have to compensate for that, right? Instead of that photographic memory, I have to actually know my material. Anyway, so when I'm teaching about mobile homes, a lot of people, uh, and I went, I almost got a listing, but I thought it was going to be rough to do it. So we both decided that, you know, she should have an agent that knows the mobile home park better than I do. But I really just wanted to see it when I went to meet with her because it was a single wide, not really very impressive older mobile home with a view of the ocean right by Malibu. And the mobile homes in the park were selling for over $900,000. But what was happening was if you went to the top of the mobile home park, what people would do is they would lease two or three spaces and they would build a phenomenal mobile home that was really more of a home. And there was one house that had, you know, those container, those, um, the containers they use. So the containers they use for shipping, they had one where it had two coming this way at an angle and one going across the top. I don't know how the hell they did that, but it was really awesome. And it was built on three lots in the mobile home park because you know what? It had a great view, it was an awesome location. So anyway, mobile homes or manufactured homes are really not that bad, but you have to disclose what they are. So mobile home and mobile mobile homes and manufactured home transfer disclosure statement. This is a form, statutory form required in sales of manufactured homes. The seller is the primary responsibility for disclosing the presence of mellow roos liens. I believe we talked about that, mellow roos liens and other assessments. This is usually stated in the transfer disclosure statement. So the transfer disclosure statement, if the seller knows they have Mela Roos, they have to disclose it. So Mela Roos makes your property taxes way higher than they would be if you didn't have Mela Roos. So if you didn't have Mela Roos, your property taxes would be an average of 1.25%. If you have Mela Roos, who knows what they can be, but I will tell you in most of the examples, if a Mela Roos payment, if your normal taxes are like 4,500 with Mela Roos, they're gonna be like 9,000 a year. So Mela Roos came about because contractors, I believe Mr. Mello and Mr. Roos, who were building homes, realized that because they're paying for schools, streets, sidewalks, lighting, you know, police departments, fire departments, they were paying for all the city and public things that had to be paid for because they were bringing more people into the community. They realized that, you know, if we didn't have to pay for that and we passed it on to the sellers, 
I mean the buyers, sorry. We passed it on to the buyers and the buyers paid for the Mella Roos. Originally it was gonna be a bond for like 20 years. So originally a 20 year Mella Roos bond or a 25 year Mella Roos bond. And then after that time, the Mella Roos would go away. But what we're seeing is we're seeing properties with Mella Roos that's not going away. And you know, they just keep collecting that tax. And it's a much higher tax. What you guys have to know as real estate professionals is when you go and show homes to somebody, if the house is bigger and it's really in a nicer area and it seems like it's newer, you might want to check and see if it has Mella Roos before you put an offer in it. Because I had a young lady looking in Lake Elsinore. And in one area of Lake Elsinore, they did not have Mella Roos. And in another area, they had it. Well, the houses that had the Mella Roos were newer, bigger, and nicer. And they cost really close to the houses that she liked. However, she was pre-approved for $345,000. And this house was $345,000. And this house was $345,000. But this one's way better. But then when we checked it, it had Mella Roos. So in order to qualify with the tax payment, she would have had to qualify for instead of 345,000, something like 380,000. So that meant that she'd get the house for 345,000, but her qualifications because the taxes did not qualify to buy the home. So if you get under contract and you're, and you're doing a deal and no one told you it had Mella Roos, then you're gonna have to figure out how to back out of it because, well, the, actually it's the seller's fault, it's misrepresentation. So, Sellers should know they have Melarus. Some of them don't. It's true. I'm telling you it's true. Because I had one that didn't know which they had Melarus. And they didn't disclose it. Okay. Nobody came after them. And nobody came after me. But it's nobody's fault. It wouldn't be my fault because a seller's supposed to disclose it. But as a real estate professional, I must admit, you need to look up your... That's what taught me to look up the tax base. So you can look up the tax base by going, usually the county will have the tax base on there and you can actually look it up. So what I started doing was when something was too good to be true, like the price was too low or something, I, if I didn't have something I could look it up on really fast, I would just call my office and ask my assistant, I'm like, look up this property, my client really likes it, the price is really low. Yes, Mark, quick question, is there a math on, is there math on the exam? No math on the exam. It says all tests are different. Pray first, answer the ones you know. That's what he's telling you. He's telling you everything I did. Go in there and pray, be calm, and then go in there and answer the ones you know first, and then go back and answer the ones you didn't know. That way you don't sit and stare at a question forever and hope that possibly it turns red like the ones in my class. The answers turn red, okay? So anyway, let's go on because we got to make sure we have action-packed stuff so you guys learn. Anyway, so um, if there's any type of containers or any type of chemicals on the property, is there? there's no math, you guys. There used to be. I don't know why everybody's so scared about math because you better learn math in real estate. I mean, because you have to be able to calculate how much money your client's going to get back in the transaction or how much your buyer's got to bring into the transaction. So as for the test, there used to be five to seven math questions. We used to know all the answers. So in my cram class when, that I used to teach for somebody else, we had the math answers. We gave them to you. You guys just went boom, 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 boom. Okay. Now they took the math questions off because the test was too hard. They're saying that 50% of the people who take the test do not pass. Well, that's because they do not study or they do not go to a prep class. And so you really got to prepare yourself. It's a test. So anyway, um, they took the math questions off because I asked the real estate commissioner, his name was Wayne Bell. And I asked him, I'm like, why is the test so, e it's so easy? He's like, well, we took the math questions off because we had to make it easier. People weren't passing. So they took the math questions off. There are two possible math questions, and there's one that has a really long number. You're trying to calculate what the property's worth based on the rental income. And if you got that question and you're in my exam prep, we have the answer. It's like $378,000. It's not $24,000. It's the biggest number on the answer. Okay, that's one. And then the other one is if you have a loan for $250,000 and you have to pay one point, how much is one point of $250,000? $2,500. That's not that hard, but they still give you a calculator for the test. They give you a calculator and a white dry erase board, but this class is about contracts, so we need to stick with the subject. Anyway, but we're so excited because you passed and so exciting because you just came out of there, right? So anyway, mortgage loan disclosure statement. It complies with the C-A-L-B-R-E regulations. So that kind of scares me because this is the 15th edition and it says Cal-B-R-E, which is 
we were the cap the not we but as real estate agents were all under the department of real estate for a short period of time, it was changed to the real, um, the Bureau of Real Estate, the California Bureau of Real Estate. And that's when we had Wayne Bell, who was a great commissioner. And then when they changed it from the, um, the Bureau, they changed it back to the department. So sometimes you'll see Cal BRE, which stands for California Bureau of Real Estate. And sometimes you'll see the Department of Real Estate. And it's now the Department of Real Estate again. So they had to change it back. Natural hazard disclosure statements used to comply with the state requirements, a substituted zone disclosure report is not used. So natural disclosure statement is if there's anything in the area, there's a hazard, okay? So the natural hazard disclosure statement covers six zones, seismic hazards, earthquake fault lines, wildland fire zones, we have fire zones in California, state responsibility areas, flood zones, and if there's a dam in the area, so we have so much water, there might be a dam in the area that might burst, and then we'll have flooding. So anyway, I was kind of joking about the lot of water in California, okay? So we're getting closer to the end. Ooh, we have purchase options. Thank goodness, right? This chapter's been kind of rough. So if you have this book, it's a good one to read because it's kind of hard. It's even hard for me to read. So if it's hard for me to read, I try to change it and tell you what it means in English. So pest control inspection, we talked about termite inspections and reports. You're going to be the president this year. <laughs> um, no, not of the board. I mean, I'm president elect right now. And so I'm president elect of just my board. So there's a bunch of boards, over 40 boards in the state of California. And then they all pour into the California Association. And this year we have all women leadership. So our president, our president elect are women and our secretary. So we usually, so that's the California Association. And then the California and all the other states go into the National Association. So when you're paying your dues to be a member, you're paying for your local board, your California board, and your national board. So, and you really want to contribute in there because it's the largest political organization in the country. And if you want to get involved and make sure that hopefully... You know, people go, well, one person isn't going to make a difference. Well, if that one person, look at, I'm one person. I have 4,000 followers. That's 4,000 followers. That's not very much, but we can make it grow, right? We need to help make it grow and help make a difference because if we don't make a difference, who knows what will happen for your children and your grandchildren? Just saying, you know? So um, you can do nothing or you could try and make a footprint, right? So the Structural Pest Control Board collects termite, inspect termite reports copies of which can be attained by anyone. You need to know that anyone for a fee. So if you drive down the street and you see somebody getting tented and you want to know what their inspection report looked like, you can get a copy of it for up to two years if you pay a fee to get a copy of it. Radon gas. So you have to know that. That's actually on the state exam. Is Structural Pest Control Board. Good morning. The Structural Pest Control Board collects termite reports, copies of which can be obtained by anyone for, you know, by request for a fee. Radon gas. Radon gas is also on your state exam. Radon gas and mold notices and release agreements as required by HUD. This form gives buyers of HUD properties. That's, that's FHA property. So FHA is a little stiffer than conventional because on FHA and VA, the termite report inspection is required. Did you hear that? It's required. So it's not required. Um, it says only needed 300. I don't know what you're talking about. Of the 300. Um, but anyway, the termite inspection and clearance and report, all that is not required on conventional loans. It's something that agents ask for to protect their clients because you don't want to buy a home and find out that it's half eaten underneath the wood by um, termites. So not required, but FHA and VA require the termite inspection. So um, as required by HUD, this form gives buyers of HUD property notice that there's no representation is being made regarding radon gas or mold. In addition, buyers release HUD, releases HUD and its agents from the liability associated with these substances. The form also advises buyers to contact a lawyer and have an inspection, always have an inspection. So let's see what else is here. The real estate transfer disclosure statement, they've brought it up several times in here because it is one of the most important forms because your seller has to, has to fill it out clearly. Not only does your seller have to fill it out, but you're not supposed to fill any of that out without them. 
You're not supposed to fill any of their forms out. They're supposed to fill them out. If they have questions, they can ask you. That's what you're there for. So the real estate property, real estate transfer disclosure statement is the property disclosure statement required by law. Did you hear that one? So the TDS has to be in the file because it's required by law in most residential sales transactions in California. That means even for sale by owners. So, you know, the people that um, are doing for sale by owners, I don't understand how they think they're going to get all their forms. Because if they're going to do it by owner and they sell it to somebody who doesn't have a seller, um, oh, movie references, gotcha. Um, I don't know a lot about movies, honestly. I just know how to, how to make one. And, and now that I'm making one, maybe I'll make another one. So, um, because I'm transparent and I want people to know what's going on. So anyway, the transfer disclosure is required by law. The seller has to disclose everything that they know or should be known about the property. Once that's done and they give it to the buyer, if they realize that they did not disclose something, they need to do an amended transfer disclosure statement because it's better to disclose everything prior to closing because if you disclose everything prior to closing, the, the buyer can back out. That's what they can do, but they can't sue. Okay, so they cannot sue you. This is on your state exam. They cannot sue you if you disclose it prior to closing. But if you don't disclose it prior to closing, they have up to two years to sue you. So I know I've said that a couple times, but the book is going back to the transfer disclosure. It has a big, huge green thing that it wants me to read, and I'm going to read it for you. Here it goes. It says, in addition to disclosing any known environmental hazards on the TDS, the seller and his or her agent should provide the buyer with a pamphlet entitled Environmental Hazards, a Guide for Homeowners, Buyers, Landlords, and Tenants, which includes sections on asbestos, you know, asbestos, and you know the popcorn ceilings. Ugh, hate popcorn ceilings. Those should all be taken out. Okay, asbestos, lead, mold, flamalgahyde, and radon. Radon is harmful gas. And on the state exam, it says, for harmful gases, are you ready for this one? For harmful gases in the house, if you suspect radon gases in your house, what should you do? And the answer on the state exam is, open the door. There's an answer that says, light a match. Do not light a match. That would be a very bad thing to do. Okay. So seller financing addendum and disclosure, probably not a lot of those out there because sellers do not do a lot of seller financing. However, I do have a friend that was a flipper. I, I know a lot of people who flipped homes and this one flipper, what he would do is flip a home and then he would go back and carry back 10%. So if the buyer could come in with 10% and he carried back 10%, then the buyer could get an 80% conventional loan. And with getting a conventional loan, then they don't have mortgage insurance because it's an 80-10-10, that's what it's called. I don't know that there's gonna be a lot of seller financing. It just depends on, you know, maybe the seller owned the house for a long, long time and um, they have a lot of equity so they'll carry back the mortgage. That's called seller financing. And by the way, seller financing would be a specific voluntary lien. So it's voluntary specifically on that property. You have to know specific and voluntary and, and involuntary and general on all the types of liens. Those are questions on your test. So we already talked about the FRIPTA, but they also have a seller affidavit on non-foreign status and or California withholding exemptions used to comply with the Federal Foreign Invest Investors Real Estate Property Tax Act, which is FRIPTA, and here it is, and the California Non-Resident Holding Laws. Documents whether tax holdings is required. Requirements are listed in on the reverse on, the, on this affidavit. One form is used for each person or entity on title. Smoke detectors. Oh my God, you guys. Don't even start me on this one. Smoke detectors and water heaters. Okay. No matter what, your seller's responsible for smoke detectors, okay? So since your, your seller's responsible for smoke detectors, they have to be in every bedroom, okay? And they have to be in the hallway and in areas where, you know, you need uh, smoke detectors, like the kitchen. So you have to have smoke detectors in the home. You have to have carbon monoxide detectors. If you have a two-story house, you have to have them on the downstairs level and the upstairs level. And what you have to do is you have to put them down below. So a lot of people put their carbon monoxide, yeah, it's carbon monoxide. They put their carbon monoxide detectors up by the um, thermostat. Well, that's really stupid because if it's up by the thermostat, by the time the alarm goes off, the people in the house are dead because carbon monoxide is at the bottom and it comes up, okay? 
So you have to have those detectors, you have to have smoke detectors, and you have to have the water heater strapped. And it has to be strapped correctly and it has to be lifted correctly. So the water heater has to be in the property in the correct way. So you want a story story? I'm, you know, I have no energy today. You were so cute when you said I had energy and I'm like, I am dragging my butt here right now. And all I do is come from upstairs and come downstairs and I haven't had coffee yet. I can't think of stories when it's the disclosures. Like, let me see if I can find a disclosure about a water heater one. But I can tell you when I did the home inspection at one house and we went to see the water heater and the water, that's the other thing you guys, you have to have the electricity and the water and everything has to be on until the home inspection's done. So people put their house for sale and they'll shut all the utilities off and then you can't do the inspections. So lots of stuff out there to know and people don't think that you have to know that much to be a real estate agent. My goodness, if you're a good one, you have to know a lot of stuff. Uh, yeah, it's been a rough couple days, right? It's been a rough couple days and we're only on Wednesday and I don't know why it's been that way. It's just been bad karma, I think. Bad karma, I'm gonna have to go sage my house or something. I don't know, we'll see. But anyway, let's go on. So, I'm trying to find a story in these disclosures. So it says, um, we have the smoke detector um, statement of compliance. The seller uses this form to certify smoke detectors are properly installed in compliance with the state and local boards. Okay, you want a story? I'll tell you a story. Are you ready? So, the smoke detectors have to be there. They have to be there before the appraiser comes. So, this is what I highly suggest. I, you know, you take a listing and you tell them at the listing appointment, you know, you when you're looking around the house, you're like looking for smoke detectors, you're looking at the water heater, you're looking at all these things when you take the listing. You're like a mini inspector. And you're looking for stuff and you tell your client. Like, I have two clients I remember. One, it was a really expensive house, and it was really nice, and he had solar, and he had everything. Um, I am, really, I am. I know God blesses me, but I'm telling you right now, it's kind of it's kind of difficult. Um, the guy that was going to do my movie disappeared for a couple days. We were really worried about him. Um, you know, just stuff that's weird that's happening around me, and I'm, like, trying to fight the battle. But anyway, um, there's always a battle somewhere, right? So anyway... Um, I was the, so the expensive guy, I told him, I said, look, I don't see the smoke detectors. You say that you have them, but let me tell you something. Before the appraiser comes, you have to have the smoke detectors up. Well, I have a brain in my head and I'm pretty smart. So I know that sellers always say they're going to do something and they don't do it. So they say buyers are liars, but hey, just wait till you start taking listings. So what I do and you guys should do is you should have the kind that have a battery, not the hard wire, okay? So there's hard wire smoke detectors and there's smoke detectors with batteries. The ones with the batteries are the easiest ones. They're more expensive, but all you have to do is stick them up. Like literally some of them have peels on the back, you peel them, stick them up and you got a smoke detector. The other ones that are hardwired, you have to know how to electrically install them. So that's too much work, but they're really cheap. So I have the ones that with the stickers on the back and the batteries and I have batteries and I have at least six smoke detectors in my car. And so I get there and we're supposed to do the home inspection. And my homeowner who said he had smoke detectors already moved out. He's in Northern California. So I meet the appraiser and do we see smoke detectors? No. So I said to the appraiser, I go, if you could start outside, I'll take care of the problem. And I ran out to my car and I got the box. And here I am, real estate agent and handy woman sticking up smoke detectors. So you got to have them because if they're not there, then the appraiser is going to leave and he's going to write on the appraisal, no smoke detectors, not in compliance. And then he's going to ask for a 442. A 442 means the appraiser has to go back out there and look at the, make sure you have the smoke detectors, take pictures of them showing that they're there and then charge your client another two or 300 bucks because he had to go back out there. So if he charges the buyer another two and $300, um, I would think that the buyer would come back to the seller and go, not my fault. I had to have a 442. But guess what? The buyers and the buyer's agents don't know why that extra charge was there. So they don't ask for it. So now you guys know about that. So also the water heater strap. His water heater was strapped fine. You have to have two water heater straps around it. And it usually needs to be up off the ground. So you need to be aware of that. And if you don't think it's in compliance, ask them or have a home inspector person talk to you about it. So that's the home, the water heaters and the smoke detectors and the carbon monoxide detector, okay? The carbon monoxide detector normally has, um, you know, prongs on it. You just plug it in the wall. 
So you just plug it in the wall somewhere low so that the people don't die in the house. Got it? Superwoman. Yeah, right. I used to look like Wonder Woman. I had dark hair, but now I look at pictures of my dark hair. I'm not so happy about that. Anyway, let's go on. So we um, supplemental. You don't need that one. Water heater one is next. Then um, we're finally to purchase options and we're almost to the back of the contract because the next page is chapter summary and the chapter summary is what you all want to be here for. However, guess what? Tomorrow we're having a broker meeting, a broker meeting with all the brokers who are interested in hearing the updates. And because I'm president elect and the president is out of town, I get to host it. I'm super excited. So I don't know if I could have somebody go and videotape it. I don't know. It'd be interesting. It would be fun. And some of the parts will be probably taped and put up on the Tri-Counties Tri -Counties Board of Realtor, um, what's it called? YouTube page, because we have a YouTube page. So never know. I might show up there. I might show up anywhere. You never know. I might show up on your YouTube chat, chat group. So it was funny because one of the girls invited me from a chat group that they were studying for their real estate test. And um, I came on and it was so fun. I was on their study group for like an hour. It was a good time. So back to purchase options and purchase agreements. So there is one called a unilateral contract and it's an option. An option is the right to purchase a property upon specific terms. So it could be that it's a lease with an option to buy and a lease with an option to buy would be you're leasing and then after two years, you go ahead and you purchase the property. Now, back in the day, this is going back, yeah, back to the 70s, late 70s, early 80s, when interest rates, you're cute, vote for Sharon. Um, when interest rates went really, really high, um, people didn't, they wanted to buy. So again, I always say this, buyers wanted to buy and sellers wanted to sell. But unfortunately, the interest rates were at 18%. So what we did was we did leases with options to buy and we did creative financing. So creative financing, there was a lot of seller carrybacks and there was a lot of things called wraparounds. Ah, get this. You have to know what those are for the state exam. We don't have 18%, but maybe it will come back and that will help you in your career know how to move those buyers and sellers forward. So the option to buy, you had to pick the price at the time. So the lease with an option to buy is a unilateral contract that is on your state exam. So after you do specific things on the property, maybe you wait for two years to go by, you take your option. An option is normally purchase to take the property off the market. So you have to take it off the market because it's a purchase. The prospective purchaser holds the exclusive right to buy during the option period. So you have an option or and an option E and you have a buyer and a seller. And the, the sad part is it's only an option. So if the buyer says, I don't want to take the option, then the seller has to sell, sell the house again because maybe the prices went down. But if the prices went up, they'd be stupid not to take the option, right? So on your state exam, you have to know an option is a contract to purchase usually with um, specific. So you have to do something before you get to the option to buy and um, you have to pick the price ahead of time. On the state exam, what you have to know is it's a unilateral contract, okay? The option E owns the option, got that? Option E owns the option. An option or OR is the property owner who gives the interested buyer the exclusive right to sell. The interested buyer is the option E. And during the time of the option E, prior to them buying it, they're the sole person that has the option to buy the property. An option E is a potential buyer who purchases an agreement to amount of time and purchases a specific property upon set terms. So you already have the terms. So it was funny because when we first came out with options and the sellers didn't want to set the options because what if the price goes way up? Because the seller's locked into it. The seller doesn't have a choice. If the if the person with the option wants to buy and the prices went way up, seller has to sell. But the option person, they don't have to take the option. So the option E doesn't have to take the option, but if they decide to take it, the seller has to sell it. And remember, the seller's the option or. So the option E does not have to go through with the purchase if they don't want to. It's good practice to obtain a preliminary title report or otherwise verify that the owner will be able to convey marketable title. So when you're doing the option contract, you want to make sure that the owner has marketable title and that may not be, I mean, they may be putting the property as an option because they're trying to figure out how to make it a marketable title. So you got to look at that stuff and you got to make sure that the owner that you're representing to sell their home is the owner of the home. So they have marketable title. 
So um, if the option E decides to buy the property during their time of the option period, the option or must sell. In, case, um, in this case, the option will become a sales contract and both parties are bound to the terms. So you could do an option with a purchase or you can do an option, um, you can do a lease with an option. So there's all types of things you can do when you're getting to the creative financing area. A salesperson who has listed an option to purchase a property from the seller must at that time highlight dis oh, sorry I said highlight disclose all terms material information and obtain consent from the seller of any anticipated profits from the seller before exercising the option so as it could be it's called a listing with an option so let's say that you list a property and you're like I really like your home I'd really like to buy it but they have the price overpriced and you're like okay so it's overpriced at the same time on the other side um, you say, well, if you ever decide to lower your price, I would buy, I would buy it. So you have a listing with an option to buy it. And let's say that you do go to buy it. Well, then you have to disclose to the seller what you're going to do at the property, what your intentions are. And you have to tell them, well, I'm going to do a two story. I had a girl that did this. She's like, I'm going to do a two story over the um, patio and I'm going to do a guest house, excuse me, a guest house where there could be horses. And I'm going to do this, this, and this, it's going to cost me this much. And I'm going to sell your house for this much. So if you're going to flip the house or you're going to do something, you have to disclose everything. And I mean everything, all your profits to the seller because you're a real estate professional and you have to disclose what you're going to do. Okay. So, and it says that on the state exam. So it says the option E may also secure another buyer for the property, sell his or her option to the party during the term. Thus, all rights and interests may be transferred without the consent of the option or unless stated otherwise. Ooh, that's interesting. You can sell your option. So if the option E has, for example, a one-year recorded option and after six months decides to exercise their option, the property owner should see to it that the quick claim deed is recorded so that the option might be removed from the records, from public record. So it is always advisable to seek the services of a real estate attorney who is knowledgeable in lease options. So if you're not sure about something you're doing, ask your broker. If your broker doesn't know, then go to a real estate attorney. During periods when buyers cannot qualify for loans, that's when they were 18% up in the, back in the 1970s, early 80s, options to purchase in future became popular in hopes of obtaining financing in the future. So hoping that the interest rates would come down. So we have gone really long today. Um, however, tomorrow we're going to do the chapter summary. So tomorrow's a chapter summary of chapter five contracts. And then let's see what's the next chapter on. The next chapter, chapter six, is on landlord tenant, less or less E. And so we'll finish up contracts chapter five and we're going to do the summary. So be here for the summary or at least watch it because the summary always has a lot of information. So until tomorrow morning, you guys have a great day. Congratulations to everybody who's passing the real estate exam. Always make sure you stay following me and subscribing to me because you never know when we're going to have that pool party or seriously speaking, an update in the real estate world. So have a great day and I look forward to helping you guys out and teaching you